Thank you for making time to do this, Dr. Dr. Oh, thank you. Dr. Great Dr. to see you again. I, I, I see all your really cool uh, Instagram posts and uh, think back uh, of a time when I was part of that. Yeah, I look, forward to, yeah. Make, I look forward to making it happen again. I'm, I found uh, it very uplifting. Yeah, yeah, literally. Um, what stumbled you upon? I want to hear about how you are and how life is and, and perspectives on the world and such. But you have a new book. That you've, I do. You've, that you've birthed. And I think something that's interesting about you is you seem to be on the forefront um, of turning over stones that people aren't noticing. And this one particular in relation, in relation to uric acid is something that I think that's that right. people even know what that is, really. So what, what, how, how did this happen? Well, you know, the, the title of the book is Drop Acid. And uh, people, I, I think that uh, it's catchy, but it's not the drop acid that people are thinking about. It's about what you said, uric acid. And why this is appealing to me is, you know, um, so much of what goes wrong in our bodies is metabolic. You know, it has its origins in inflammation, elevated blood sugar, insulin resistance, hypertension, obesity, all the things that are metabolically uh, compromised by our modern lifestyle. You know, they underpin things like Alzheimer's, heart disease, uh, even some forms of cancer. So, Anything that can be a tool to help our metabolism uh, become more normalized is going to be very interesting for me, and I'm going to look into it. And, uh, and it turned out that this uric acid thing uh, is something that people are looking at around the world and have been doing so for decades. And, uh, you know, we here in the United States have been a little bit late to that party. But nonetheless, uh, it's very clear that, you know, the uric acid that I learned about years ago and that I would measure was only in the context of something called gout. You know, if a person had gout, their uric acid level would be high. And if you lower their uric acid level, they wouldn't get these gout attacks, painful crystals in their toes and fingers. And that was it. End of story. And now we know that this uric acid is a powerful metabolic signal. It's telling our bodies, basically, prepare for winter. Make and store as much fat as you can. Uh, raise your blood sugar, raise your blood pressure, because you're going to need that to survive. And, you know, who needs that, right, these days? But that's, that's what our physiology uh, is programmed to do. And that was a good thing for about 99.9% .9 of our time on this planet. Gave us an advantage, a survival advantage. Nowadays, you know, based on the, our current environment, with so much fructose that makes uric acid, it's turning on this survival mechanism that we sure as heck don't need. We don't need to be making more blood sugar and raising our fat levels and our belly sizes and our blood pressure. But again, in the context of our ancestors, this was really what we needed to do, raise uric acid uh, because it let them survive and pass that whole genetic machinery down to you and me. Hmm. So uh, upon researching or looking up uric acid on the interwebs, most commonly it's considered a waste product and it would be peed out or pooped out and you can have start to have raised levels and then that can lead to things like gout and um, you know joint issues and and the issues that you just mentioned I haven't read about so much um, so but I, I'd be interested to define specifically what is uric acid is it exclusively a waste product product? Well, you know, it, we've thought about it for years as a waste product. And again, if we didn't excrete enough of it or reproduce too much of it, our levels would go up and lo and behold, we would get gout. And that was all you needed to know for the test, right? And then, oh, what drug do you use to, to help that uh, re help reduce it? Allopurinol. Did I get it right? And that was so simple. But as is so often the case, nature you know, is very conservative and uses, repurposes a lot of different things to do a lot of uh, different tasks in our bodies, and, and as it is with uric acid. Again, a powerful signaling molecule, not just the end product of our metabolism of three things. Fructose, fruit sugar, which is incredibly abundant in our diets, alcohol, and purines, which are the breakdown products of basically DNA and RNA found in higher levels in certain things like organ meats and anchovies and sardines and things like that. So, it's telling our bodies, uh, you know, when we are able to consume fructose, when we're hunting and gathering and we find in, in the late summer some ripened blueberries and we consume them and get fructose into our bodies, it's a way that our bodies, through uric acid signaling, makes more fat. 
So we, those of our ancestors between 14 and 17 million years ago who developed the mutations that caused higher levels of uric acid, made more fat, they were selected for during what is called the middle Miocene period when the earth was really cool and uh, cooler and the, uh, the availability of food was declining. So they had this superpower. They made just a little bit more fat. They made just a little bit more blood sugar to power their brains so that they didn't face the two big threats of starvation and predation. In other words, they could find food and they wouldn't be food. And we carry that inherited legacy of having higher uric acid levels, uh, as do you know most of the great apes uh, like them. We have higher uric acid levels and are exquisitely able to make body fat when we're exposed to higher levels of fructose. Now, when you think about that, that was a powerful survival mechanism. Ripe fruit, fructose, high uric acid, you survived. Nowadays, you know, between 1970 and 1990, our fructose consumption increased 1,000%. So we're stimulating this pathway unnecessarily. I mean, winter isn't coming. The time of, no, of having no food or water is not likely to come. But yet, we're turning on this pathway that's preparing us for the winter that never comes and look around. You know, right now, as you and I have this conversation, a third of American adults is obese. And by the, the distant future, 2030, that's eight years from now, uh, that'll be 50%. 50% of adults in America, not just overweight, but obese, clinically obese, that's, that's scary. You know, 10% of kids between 12 and, and 18 years of age uh, have hypertension. Wow. You know, I, it goes without saying, then of course I say it, uh, that, you know, diabetes rates are, are going through the roof. And all of these metabolic things pave the way for other things downstream. Heart disease, uh, as I mentioned, diabetes, Alzheimer's, some form of cancer. So we, we've got to rein in our metabolic health pronto. And We've known since 1970, published in the journal The Lancet, that fructose opens the door to metabolic mayhem. But two things happened. First, we didn't understand the mechanism. And second, there were really great efforts uh, on the other side of that to keep us from knowing that. Uh, that we were told fat was the villain, right? Don't eat fat, but eat plenty of sugar. And, and fructose of all the sugars is the safest because it doesn't activate insulin. Man, oh man. Um, you know, that went on for uh, an incredibly long period of time, unfortunately, but now we know the truth. Now, yes, we understand how fructose is related to destroying our metabolism and through this mechanism of turning on our production of this signaling molecule called uric acid. So I would tell you, if you want to learn about, aside from reading Drop Acid, all you got to do is Google two words, uric and metabolic. You don't want to Google uric and metabolism, because then you'll get the metabolism of uric acid. Google two words, uric and metabolic, and wow, it will light up, and you're just going to raise your eyebrows and say, why, that's fantastic. Hashtag WTF, why, that's fantastic. <laughs> Is it exclusively a nutritional conversation, or are there any other factors that would signal uric acid in the body? There are a lot of other factors, um, and we definitely want to unpack the nutritional uh, because it's well beyond just high purines, alcohol, and fructose. It's actually salt that we, we need to talk about. But mm -hmm. lifestyle as well. Uh, we know that not getting enough restorative sleep, higher uric acid. Uh, we know that uh, exercise uh, helps lower uric acid, that fasting will transiently raise uric acid but ultimately help lower it. But the big issues are related to the inroads directly, which are our food choices Primarily, this incredible 55 pounds of sugar is what the average American, 55 yeah. pound bags of sugar a year. And that is table sugar. That's 50% uh, fructose and 50% glucose. So <laughs> we are day in and day out preparing for winter and preparing for times when we won't have food or we won't have water. And that leads us to another interesting sidelight, and that is not only is it the fructose that we consume, it's the fructose that our bodies can make as well. So we can produce fructose in our bodies from glucose, from our blood sugar. We can make fructose and that go, goes ahead and turns on our fat production, our fat factories, if you will. 
And why might that be? And because it's a survival mechanism, yes, for fat, but also to keep us hydrated. How does it work? When you're dehydrated, your serum sodium goes up. And that's a powerful signal for the enzymes to make more fructose, to make more body fat. Well, what's the relation? If you're dehydrated, why do you need body fat? I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> because body fat, when you metabolize it, you form two things, carbon dioxide and water. So body fat is a powerful resource from which we can make fresh water. You know, why do you think a camel has a hump? You stick a straw in a camel's hump, there's no water in it. It's fat. And it makes fat as it's crossing the desert. Gram for gram, every gram of fat makes actually a little bit more than one gram of water. So this is a powerful resource from which the camel and you and I could make water if we turn on that enzyme when we're dehydrated, enzyme pathway. Wow. Whales. Whales have so much blubber. Yeah, it's an energy resource, and maybe it insulates them when they go down a 1,000 feet, but it's also where they get their fresh water. So um, we have outside of our house manatees, sea cows, and boy, they're big. They are fat, and that's one of the things they do. They burn that fat. Uh, to make fresh water. They also seek out fresh water under, underwater wells, which are uh, springs, which is why I think we have them near our house because we have a spring there. But by and large, animals store fat for energy and for water. So even dehydration. The reason I, I brought that up is because, again, when we're dehydrated, serum sodium goes up, bingo, make more fat, make more water. But you can raise your serum sodium and not be dehydrated, raise the serum sodium and trigger the whole thing by eating a lot of salt. You know, you sit, park your butt in front of the TV and start eating those big hard pretzels that are loaded with salt, and the next thing you know, uh, your serum sodium goes up, and now you understand what that does. And we've known for many years that people who eat a lot of salt are going to be fat and are at increased risk for diabetes and other metabolic, certainly high blood pressure. I mean, that, that's old news. Now we know the mechanism, and it's through the activation of uric acid. And within the, the salt conversation, is all salt created equal? Is there some salt that you know is more permissible, some some that's less? Or like, what does salt mean? Well, I, I think that you know there people use salt uh, substitutes, potassium chloride, for example, and uh, I would say that uh, the the body, the kidney is exquisitely sensitive to sodium, so. That could be a workaround. But I think that ideally you would want to create a situation where you're less liking or appreciating salty flavor, much as you try to avoid sugar to train your body to not really crave as much sweet as it might have if you're giving into that all the time. Yeah. And so, so how does sleep end up signaling the body to be producing more uric acid? Is it just, is it just stress in general? Is, it, is, that, is that kind of what it is? It, it, it might well be through the activation of cortisol and also dramatically in uh, increasing inflammation. Uh, I don't, you know, these are the studies on sleep and elevated uric acid are more correlative. Uh, I don't know that anyone has fully worked out those mechanisms, but it's quite clear that people who don't sleep enough or get enough restorative sleep have a higher uric acid levels. And, you know, that might well explain then why people who don't get enough sleep have a much higher risk of weight gain and type 2 diabetes and uh, depression. You know, these are all inflammatory disorders. So this might be that mechanism that we never fully understood. I would suspect that cortisol elevation is related in some way. Uh, and I also would not be surprised if uh, increased retention of uric acid at the kidney could be triggered by, um, by having not enough restorative sleep. Is there any term be bioelectric conversations? Is spending time in nature supportive or being around trees or being around the ocean or water? Is that is there anything about correlates or relationships to uric acid? In in the exact contents of uh, 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 in the exact um, realm of uric acid, there's probably not that I'm aware of much literature in re in relation to that. As you know, uh, our last book, Brainwash, was really all over that. Uh, the, yeah. the, just the even 20 minutes of nature exposure, whether 
you know, whether you're getting outside, even in an urban environment where there is some nature, or even having a house plant or a photograph of an outside environment, has incredibly dramatic effects on on brain wiring, on allowing us to be more connected uh, to what's called the prefrontal cortex and therefore better decision making. So having said that, we know that getting out of nature is really a powerful tonic as it relates to keeping the adult in the room and making better decisions. Now, many of those decisions that we make have to do with food. Therefore, it might allow us to be a little bit more restrictive in our fructose consumption, allowing us to certainly eat fruit because that's not really demonstrated to eat to raise uric acid in moderation, but it's the fruit juice and the sodas and the 60 to 70 percent of grocery store packaged foods that have added sweetener. Yikes. So, uh, you know, that might be the connection then between nature exposure, which, uh, gosh, we've been advocating for quite some time. Yeah. So something I've already blown smoke up your butt about how kind and generous of a human that you are. Uh, but I've had more evidence from, from various other, other sources just uh, reconfirming how sweet it is to spend time with you and how um, you know, just generous you are with, with, with time and with conversation and your compassion, all these things. And I think that that is such a rare thing with someone that's as successful as you are. Um, you know, and so I, I wonder from your side of the fence, from your lens, like what, what's caused you to stay so humble and interested and like a student, like you're, you're still a student. At first, I'm, I'm, I'm very, uh, honored and taken by those comments. Uh, interestingly, you said sweet, you know, that's always a positive thing, right? Be sweet today uh, because that's, you know, we, we seek out sweet. But to answer that question, I, I, I probably would say that um, my dad had a huge influence on me. Hmm. And, um, you know, he was really just a very special, compassionate, empathetic individual and always uh, made it clear that, um, you know, that we have an obligation to others. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm trying to live my life to fulfill, you know, his, his teachings. Um, you know, ironically, me being a neurologist specializing in Alzheimer's, he died of Alzheimer's disease. So there is a lot of, there's a lot of messaging in all of that to, uh, you know, to, to use whatever skills and talents you have and, uh, you know, be the doctor. Doctor means teacher. It doesn't mean healer. It doesn't mean the guy who gets you better. It means teacher, ultimately. That's the meaning of the term, not that there are other things that we don't do. And it's funny because I was just thinking about this last week. I, I sat with a, a friend, Maria Shriver, uh, and you know, she's a part of the Kennedy family. And she, she personifies this as well. She's dedicated her life, in her case, to women's health. And you sit with her, and it's all about the outreach. You know, she's you know, been blessed by, by many things, you know, privileged. And yet she's day in and day out, goes to her office and works this thing that is trying to help women understand what they can do to, to be healthy and to stay that way. So, so I thank you. I thank you for that. Yeah. I heard, this is not exactly how this goes, but a healer heals a, a master teaches people how to heal themselves. And the last part, I'm not sure, I think maybe sage or something that's higher up than master um, shows people that they're already healed. You know, and mm. I, 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 I wonder how that lands for you. The idea of like, I think some, oftentimes the concept of health seems like something that's like out there, you know, and it seems like this foreign alien scenario that, you know, being, being healthy or being, being in the body that I want to be in you know, or the, the relationship that I want to be in. Yeah. And I think that in, in Western cultures, we, um, we tend to tend to be convinced that we need to offload that to doctors, Yeah, that doctors have the answer for all of our maladies. And, you know, the truth of the matter is so many of the, I mean, the most pervasive issues that we fear the most are lifestyle are a manifestation of misaligned lifestyle choices, you know, as it is with what we're talking about today. And that, you know, doctors sort of want you to believe you can live your life however you want, and then we're going to fix it. Well, 
You don't really fix diabetes when you take a diabetes pill. You just lower the blood sugar. We don't have a pill to treat Alzheimer's. Uh, there are you know, these heroic things we do for people who get closure of their coronary arteries. But you know, I think the real work in, is done by giving people the empowerment, the tools, the knowledge to stay healthy on the front end. You know, the, uh, the fourth century yellow emperor in China said that prevention is the ultimate principle of wisdom. To cure a disease after it has manifest is like digging a well when one feels thirsty or forging weapons when the war has already begun. And, you know, for, for many people watching us together today, the war has already begun. I mean, they're already having issues. And, you know, again, the... The misguided hope is that doctors are going to fix it for you. And the reality is that, first, we have tools that uh, can help, our, help, we can heal ourselves, truly. Uh, and that uh, the, the notion of emphasizing prevention, uh, I think, is really fundamental. Keeping yourself healthy and with great vitality so that you have a long but, and also healthy lifespan, health span and lifespan. So it's about you know, the value of our lifestyle choices. And importantly, what is the relationship of our lifestyle choices, the environment in which we place our entire physiology in relation to our evolution? In other words, how are our lifestyle choices being read by our genome that has been cultivated for millions of years to get us to the place where we are today, refined that genome that has received a really pretty specific, stable set of information or signals for more than 99% of the time we've been on this planet. Suddenly, 14 to 17,000 years ago, the tables were turned when we developed agriculture. And then more recently, in the past couple of hundred years, with the development of, of refining uh, carbohydrates to make sugar and the production of food, the manufacturing of food, it's confronting our physiology and our genome with what we call maladaptive signaling. You know, it, it, and our genome doesn't know what to do to keep us healthy. I, I wrote my first article about this a half a century ago uh, in the Miami Herald in 1971 when I was 16. And I asked the question uh, in this feature article. I was really happy I got to be the feature article. I got a bunch of copies of that and gave them to everybody. Uh, but I said, you know, what about those of us living today with this outdated machinery? You know, our machinery, our bodies, our genome is more suited to the confrontation by the environment that it received for a long, awful long time, you know, millions of years, going back to our primate ancestors, millions of years. Mm -hmm. Now there's this mismatch, and look what's happening all around us. Yeah. I wonder, uh, as in relation to the... You know, suggesting or showing people that they're that they're already healed obviously that's not like you know just being blind to the fact that there's weeds in your yard like you've got to go out and pick the weeds that's something tony robbins said um, but i wonder it feels like we all have an intuition on what's best for us at a mental emotional cellular you know biological level but it seems like there's so much noise kind of um, you know, in the signal uh, in the form of maybe high fructose corn syrup or sleep disruption or blue lights or a nature deficit or, you know, malaligned relationships or maybe a lack of purpose or a confusion of what the hell I'm doing here. You know, and, and, and it seems like, like how much, how do you educate a person as a doctor to start to trust themselves and trust their own intuition and cultivate their own intuition? Well, it, it takes uh, a bit of work. I mean, uh, there's been this inculcation of the paradigm, again, that we doctors, perhaps not including myself, hopefully, uh, have all the answers and uh, we'll, we'll get you out of your fix, no matter what it is. And the reality is that's just not true. And I think people need to embrace that. And most people, I think, ultimately don't. Uh, that, you know, we have to let people know that they need to stand up for themselves, be their own most important advocate, and to really rein it in. And what we're convinced to do is let the amygdala run the show, let our primitive brain and our primitive desires run the show and make bad decisions that 
play out in the future uh, uh, with respect to health being compromised, etc. Whereas we can bring online our prefrontal cortex, the front part of our brains, and rain, you know, be the adult in the room, exercise top-down control, and make decisions that are better for us today, better for us tomorrow, and better for the other guy as well. In other words, empathy. Yeah. And that's the part of the brain that we bring online actively when we're, as you said earlier, in nature, when we get enough sleep, when we reduce inflammation, when we meditate. These are ways to turn on the prefrontal cortex and ultimately make better choices, not just for ourselves, but for the next person, for the future generations, and for the planet even today. Unfortunately, that connection that we so depend upon to let that prefrontal cortex be the adult in the room and rein in the more primitive amygdala part of the room, uh, room uh, in terms of decision making is threatened by a unique process called inflammation. So inflammation in our bodies keeps us from tapping into our higher self. That is something to get your arms around because that inf inflammation can come from anything. And one area that it comes from, aside from you know, the stress and the blue light and the not getting to sleep, an important area is our dietary choices, which have changed incredibly dramatically recently. In other words, what we used to call the SAD diet, the standard American diet, be, you know, the highly processed pro-inflammatory diet, became the Western diet became the global diet, meaning that this pro-inflammatory diet is now keeping people around the planet from being able to tap into their more, uh, high, their higher self, the adult in the room, and impulsivity and self-centeredness runs rampant. We're watching that play out, but to think that this is a manifestation of the globalization of this Western diet I mean, you take you take a step back, but it it really calls us to the table then, to be more vociferous in what we know to be what we believe to be truth today, based upon the the research that we uh, that we read that good people are doing. We wrote a um, a letter to President Biden on February the twenty first of two thousand twenty one, published in in MedPage today, along with uh, a Dr. Casey Means. Uh, where we called out the fact that the USDA food uh, dietary recommendations that last for five years from 2020 to 2025 that were approved during 2020 prior to his administration uh, called for allowing up to 10% sanctioning up to 10% of our calories coming from sugar, refined mm -hmm. carbohydrates and sugar. Despite the fact that virtually every scientist who weighed in said 6% or less, that's for sure. You know, but then again, the USDA is, you know, who's in charge of agriculture, uh, you know, corn growth to the tune of uh, our government subsidizing the growth of corn in America, $500 billion each year. Corn becomes high fructose corn syrup that makes its way into the very foods that we eat, the sugar that we are consuming. So from a financial perspective, we made that recommendation, but mostly from a health uh, perspective and its financial blowback, of course, with people getting sick, you know, with, as mentioned, 50% of, of American adults being obese, um, diabetes off the charts, that's costing us a huge amount of, of money that could go to many other things that would be beneficial, but it's bankrupting us, you know, just paying for health care. We spend so much on health care compared to other countries as much as, th as three times, and yet um, the various parameters of health and longevity in the United States uh, rank us really very low in compared to other so-called industrialized uh, nations. Yeah. So, you know, money talks, and uh, we called it out, and that's what we do, right? You expose yourself a little bit to criticism, that's okay. You know, that's what it's all about. And people say, well, gosh, this is really out of the box thinking. Is that what you want to do is always be outside the box? No. What I want to do is make the box bigger. I want these ideas. I wanted gluten and eating refined carbohydrates when I wrote Grain Brand. I wanted that to be in the box, and it is now, as we all know. 
people have recognized that what gluten can do and certainly what refined carbohydrates can do, especially as it relates to the brain. And yet, what did we see in February of this year? We saw, uh, or 2021, we saw you know, the, the release of a wonderful Alzheimer's uh, drug, right? Uh, a drug that could help reverse Alzheimer's. Number one, it did not do that. Number two, it was $56,000 a year per patient. And number three, what happened? Neurologists around the country said, you know what? There's no data to support that this is even working and we're not going to do it. So people finally get to the place of realizing that, you know, even as it relates to Alzheimer's, we don't have uh, anything in our bag of tricks, but we do have a new tool in our bag of tricks to help you maintain metabolic health. And that is keeping your uric acid lower, keeping it where it belongs, not in the so-called normal range as it relates to gout. You know, we're told if our uric acid level is seven, that's okay. Please understand that level of seven milligrams per deciliter is the, the peak, the top normal level only in the context of gout because that's when uric acid starts to form crystals in your blood, in your body. Uh, so we say less than 5.5 milligrams per deciliter because that's the level below which we've really had an impact on reducing risk for cardiometabolic disease. And that's what this whole discussion is about. A huge study was published in 2009 uh, looking at 42,000 men and 48,000 women and following them for eight years. Can you imagine? That's a big study. And they found that after the eight-year period, they checked their uric acid levels at the beginning of the eight years. After eight years had elapsed, those who had the highest uric acid had a 38% increased risk for death from cardiovascular disease, a 35% increased risk of death from stroke, and a 16% increased risk of death from any cause whatsoever. And what I found so compelling is that they found that for every point elevation above seven, so when you got to eight, you had an 8 to 13% increased risk of death for any cause, all-cause mortality. And every point thereafter, again, another 8 to 13% increased risk of death from any cause, you name it, including cancer, including getting hit by a bus, maybe because you're not cognitively intact, who knows. But that's above 7. And, you know, typically you go to a doctor's office right now and you have a uric acid of uh, 69 and the doctor's going to say, well, you're in the normal range. And I would submit that anybody who's following Aaron Alexander is not who we need to give the normal range to. We need to give the optimal range. We want peak performance. We want optimal health, not normal. Because normal means average. And look around at what is average. And it, it's not good enough for people who are, are following you. Where, where does pain come into the conversation? Because I think... As far as symptoms go, if someone's not their ideal shape, you know, they feel fat, you know, that'll cause them to make a change. And if they're in pain, that'll create a, a change. I think hearing like about all, all cause mortality and things of the sort, it's like, ah, that's later. <laughs> is, is, is physical pain or, or maybe mental, emotional pain or just any like, well, I'm glad you did feeling. that. Go ahead. I was about to do that. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, so, that's it. uh, you know, pain in general uh, is going to activate the alarm system. It's a powerful signal that something is wrong and I am under threat. So uh, emotional pain, same thing. Uh, but, you know, that's what pain does. So that tends to lock us into that amygdala, poor decision-making part of the brain to do things right now and to really be hyper-focused on whatever it is that is painful and takes us away from being mindful, and that is taking us away from the better decision maker, the more uh, adult uh, in the room, and therefore our decision making is uh, less appropriate. We're going to eat uh, foods uh, in the short term uh, that we know are not good for us, but we just need to be satisfied in the hopes of diverting us away from that physical or emotional pain. It's why people do tend to make bad choices not just with respect to food, but their other lifestyle uh, inputs when they are experiencing uh, the pain of depression uh, or the pain of, uh, or from something physical. Yeah, yeah, that's the, that I've, I've read that's the number one leading cause of disability worldwide 
is is depression. He was feeling. Like, That's right. What's the, what's and the purpose? especially now, you know, there have been hundreds of millions more cases of depression being diagnosed since COVID began. You know, on the substrate of this being probably one of the largest health threats on our planet, with a third of adults experiencing depression globally. And now that number is increasing quite significantly. Hmm. And, you know, that is in the face of really pretty poor efficacy of the uh, the treatments, the, the medical treatments that people receive for uh, for depression. And, you know, how available are those treatments globally? Not very. But even the countries that have accessibility to so-called antidepressant medication, only there are only a third of the people with major depressive disorder respond to those drugs. What about the other two thirds? Uh, and so it's very uh, exciting to see some real interesting developments as it relates to, to that, in, not only in terms of treatment, uh, using all kinds of uh, new ideas like ketamine or even more psychedelic types of approach used in sure. clinical situations, but uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation uh, as well. There are a variety of new approaches to treating depression that I think are extremely valuable. Uh, and even those that target inflammation as a central mechanism of depression, things like uh, looking at what's going on within the gut in terms of the microbial populations and the uh, permeability of the gut lining and how that relates to increasing these inflammatory chemicals in the body, in the brain, that have direct effects in terms of mood, but also work through various pathways that then limit the availability of serotonin. Inflammation compromises the ability that we have to make serotonin, if you, I hate to say it, the happy chemical, but the chemical that might be related in higher availability to less depression. There are pathways that when inflammation is present, pull our tryptophan away from making serotonin and shuttle it into making things that are actually bad for the brain. So we call this the kynurenic acid path pathway. For those of your uh, viewers who are <laughs> wanting to know where to go for that information, but uh, you know, one of the most powerful uh, things that goes on in our physiology that amps up inflammation is high uric acid. Uric acid is powerfully inflammatory, powerfully increases uh, the production of free radicals, incredibly important in increasing uh, insulin resistance compromises something called nitric oxide. So reduces our blood vessels ability to expand, reduces blood supply to our organs, reduces how insulin works by virtue of inhibiting nitric oxide. So, you know, it's a, it's a bad player in the context of our current lifestyle. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, you have to run out of here, right? You're, you, you get a, a thing at 430? 430. 430. Uh, is, yes. Yeah. Um, is it possible to just do a, like a super turbo quick run through of the, the bullet points, takeaway points people could uh, would need to know? <laughs> the, lightning round. the lightning round. Are you round, ready? Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, your viewers, you know, we didn't schedule that we had a hard app. We had some technical issues. We had some took issues. took us 15, 20 Completely minutes. Completely on my through. end. No, no, no. I'm not saying whose end it's on, but that's the reason because it's not like I would have only scheduled you X amount of time. I have something yeah. more yeah. important than Aaron Alexander yeah, right now, no. but I, I, do, I do not want to be rude to the, the next uh, group. But nonetheless, uh, uh, let, let me summarize then. The uric acid turns out to be a powerful lever we can pull to help improve our metabolism, along with many other things that people know about. Getting enough sleep, uh, doing the exercise, all the things... Uric acid is now uh, on the table. It's in our, it's a new tool in the toolbox. What raises uric acid is fructose, alcohol, and purines. Mostly in our diets, it's the fructose as found in fruit juice and in sodas. Fruit, reasonable amounts, is totally fine. It is offset in terms of raising uric acid by the vitamin C, the bioflavonoids, and the fiber that all work to lower uric acid. Purine-rich foods include things like organ meats, uh, small fish, sardines, anchovies, herring. Can you eat them? Yes, you can eat them. But measure your own uric acid level and see if it's affecting you. Like 
eating foods and watching your blood sugar on your continuous glucose monitor. You can buy a uric acid monitor online, on Amazon or online, other places, and have it at your home in a couple of days. They're not hugely expensive, and it's a finger stick, just like uh, measuring your blood glucose. Uh, a couple of key supplements, quercetin, 500 milligrams a day, a day. A luteolin, another bioflavonoid, 100 milligrams per day. DHA, mostly from fish oil, but there are vegetarian sources, 1,000 milligrams per day. Chlorella vulgaris, or just typical chlorella, that's the Latin name, 1,000 milligrams per day. And finally, good old vitamin C helps us excrete uric acid, 500 milligrams per day. Now, what a person might need to do to get her uric uh, acid level below 5.5 or his uric acid level below 5.5, same for men and women, uh, will be determined by measuring the uric acid level. But, and you'll keep in mind that high uric acid paves the way for metabolic mayhem in terms of blood pressure, body weight, um, dyslipidemia, elevated triglycerides, uh, and even insulin resistance. We've got to rein in our metabolism. Powerful tool for longevity and not just living a long life, but a healthy life. And, you know, the body work is so important as well as, gosh, Aaron, you've made so clear to us over so many years. Amazing, man. Um, thank you so much. I so oh, my pleasure. always appreciate the moments with you um, and just your impact on, on you know, us, the world. Um, the, the last, last thing, who would the book be? Who should buy the book? Just any, should every person. I would say if the way to know if you need this book or not is if you have a vowel in your name, if there's a vowel in your name, then you need to read drop acid. Why? Good. Because the time to fix a roof is when the sun is shining, that we need to uh, know uh, our uric acid levels in our twenties and our thirties. When we see, as I mentioned earlier, 10% of kids, adolescents having hypertension, they need to rein in their uric acid. An incredible study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association treated uh, pre-hypertensive adolescents who had elevated uric acid with a, a, a drug, a, a gout drug, to lower their uric acid, and lo and behold, their blood pressures improved. So it's a very, very big deal. And we can dramatically impact uric acid with quercetin. Uh, you know, with luteolin, which uh, we could talk about, Kristen, uh, for our next hour together in terms of yep. all the cool things that it does. But yep. man, that's one of my showcase supplements these days. That's for sure. Amazing. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, so people grab uh, the book. It's in, in probably bookstores, Amazon. It comes out February. Is like February 22nd, 15th? February 15th. Uh, 15th Pre-orders yeah. at any time. Uh, and it's called, uh, here it is, it's called Drop Acid. And as you can see, there is a cherry because it turns out that eating tart cherries has been uh, a therapy for gout patients for decades because it lowers uric acid. Who knew? Amazing. Thank you, sir. Thank you, my friend. You. Good to see you. Thank, yeah, thank you Talk all for to tuning you soon. in. Yep, that's it. That's all. Over now. Pow.